I love to travel, and I'm certain that most of you people do too. But I've never been able to travel light. Yes, I've tried, but remember, I'm an old pathfinder. I've taken the pledge to be prepared, so that's how I travel, prepared. Janelle laughs at me and says, prepared for what? A war, a flood, sudden blackout, stuck for a week, invasion of bats, what? It's hard to travel light. There's a lot I, I know to the art of packing, or should I say, not packing. It's hard to pack without granola bars, water, soda, tracking system, weapons, flashlights, rope, ice chest, wiener sticks, five pair of undies and socks. Okay, loosen up, Jim, you're thinking. You cannot enjoy the journey carrying so much stuff. You know, that's true. Have you been known to pick up a few bags? It's possible you did just this morning. Somewhere between the first steps out the, of bed and the last steps out the door, you might have grabbed some luggage. You don't remember doing that? That's because we don't do it without thinking. Didn't see the baggage terminal, did you? It's because it's not the terminal at the airport or bus depot. It's the terminal in your mind. The bags aren't made out of leather. They're made of burdens. The suitcase of guilt the sack of discontent, a duffel bag of weariness on one shoulder, a hanging bag on the other, full of grief. A backpack of doubt, an overnight bag of loneliness, or a trunk of fear. Pretty soon, you've got more than a wheelbarrow full of troubles. No wonder we're so tired at the end of the day. Luggage is exhausting. What does God say to us? Set that stuff down. You're carrying burdens you don't need to bear. Come to me, all who carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Matthew eleven twenty-eight. 28. If we let him, God will lighten our loads. Psalms 23 says so. There's no better advice that exists. It's framed and hung on hospital walls. It's scratched on prison walls. It's quoted by the young and the old. Whispered by the dying, sailors use it when they're lost at sea. And because Psalms 23 is so deeply loved, it's widely known. Few haven't read or heard it. It's set to music in many songs, translated into many different languages, engraved on many hearts. Hopefully, it's on your heart. Do you have some luggage? Do you think God might use David's psalms to lighten your load? Traveling light means trusting God with your burdens, the ones you were never intended to bear. Try traveling light. Try it for yourself and for those you love. For the sake of those you love, learn to set them down. And for the God you serve, set your burdens down. God wants to use you. But how can he use you if you're exhausted? God has a great race for you to run. And under God's care, you will go where you've never been and serve where you've never dreamed. 
but you have to drop some stuff. How can you share grace when you're full of guilt? How can you bring comfort when you're disheartened? How can you lift someone else's load if your arms are full of your own? For the sake of those you love, travel light. For God's sake, travel light. For your own joy, travel light. There are certain weights in your life you simply cannot bear. Jesus is asking you to set them down and just trust him. God is saying, set it down. I'll carry that. If we take God up on his offer, we'll find ourselves traveling light. I cannot overstate 1 Peter 5, 7. Jesus says, unload all your worries on me, since I am looking out for you. I'm only a few feet away from this eagle. I'm gonna call it an eagle, Janelle calls it a hawk. You call it, just call it a bird. What is it, Don? It's an eagle? Yay, all right. I'm only a few feet away from this eagle. He's cool, isn't he? He's got sharp eyes, big talons, long beak. He's so close, I can touch him. Should I? Why not? I'm not afraid of him. He hasn't moved in more than 10 years. I know the man who carved this bird. I admire this bird knowing how hard the wood is to work and how beautiful the grains on the color is. Yeah, it's just a man-made bird. He's cool, but now he sits in a corner and collects dust. I'm actually quite used to him. King David is concerned that you and I might make the same mistake with God. David is urging us to avoid gods of our own making. In the very first line of Psalms 23, David tells us who God is. In the second and third line, he tells us what God can and will do for us. That's why David wrote the Psalms, to build our trust in God, to remind us who God is. In this Psalms, David devotes 150 words to explain the first two words, the Lord. David didn't say, the Lord is a genie in a bottle, convenient, congenial, need a parking spot, win the lottery, God help me, rub the bottle and poof, it's done. God is not a, a sweet grandpa, soft-hearted, wise, kind, but very, very, very old. Grandpas are great when they're awake, but tend to doze off when you really need them. God's not a busy dad that leaves on Monday and returns on Saturday to clean up and look spiritual. Ever feel that way about God? The problem is busy dads don't always have the time for questions. Grandpas are too weak to carry your load. And if God's a genie in a bottle, 
then you're greater then you're greater than the bottle is and the genie. He operates at your command, a God that looks nice, but really does very little. Is that the God you want? Is that the God we have? David's answer is a loud no. David said, God is Yahweh. My shepherd, God Almighty, God Most High, God the Everlasting, all God's titles, but his name is I Am Who I Am, Yahweh. God told Moses, this is my name, Yahweh, and I am all of the above, and why is this important to us? Because we need a big God. The one who is and the one who cares. Think about this. When we say, I am, we always add another word. I am happy. I am sad. I am fat. I am hungry. I am sleepy. I am frank. God says, however, I am. That's it. Nothing added. God needs no descriptive word because he never changes. God is who he is. He always has been the same. Psalms 102, 27. Yahweh is an unchanged God. Even though God creates, he was never created. He is from everlasting to everlasting, Psalms 92. Yahweh is an unchanged God, an ungoverned God. You and I are governed by the weather. It tells us what to wear. The terrain tells us how to travel. Gravity dictates our speed. Health determines our strength. We might challenge these forces, but we can never, ever remove them. God, our shepherd, doesn't check the weather. He makes it. He, he defies gravity. After all, he created it. God has no limitations. He's unchanged, ungoverned, just a fraction of God's qualities, but enough to give us a glimpse of who he is. We need this kind of shepherd. We need an uncaused God a God not brought into existence by a cause. No one breathed life into Yahweh. No one sired him. No one caused him. No one brought him forth. And since no act brought him forth, no act can take him out. God does not fear earthquakes or tornadoes. Yahweh calms the winds with his word. Cancer doesn't trouble him. Cemeteries don't disturb him. He was here before they were, and he'll be here long after they're gone. He is uncaused. Counselors can comfort you in the storm, but God can still the storm. Friends hold your hands at your deathbed, but you need Yahweh who has defeated the grave. Philosophers debate the meaning of life. Jesus declares he's the meaning of life. You need Yahweh. You don't need to carry the burdens of a lesser God, a God on a shelf, a God in a box or a bottle, 
We need a God who can place 100 billion, with the B, stars in our galaxy and 100 billion galaxies in the universe. You need a God who can put 75 to 100 billion nerve cells with more than 10,000 connections to other nerve cells in one skull and call it a brain. That's the mind-blowing mighty God we serve. But he is also sometimes quietly, softly coming to us in the night to tenderly comfort us to sleep. We need this kind of Yahweh. And David says we do. And he is your shepherd. Our shepherd is a patient God. He lovingly helps us to do to be patient and apologize instead of argue. He helps us to listen instead of opening our big mouth. When we give it to God, he will fix us when we cannot. We need a God to dissolve our stubbornness, independence, self-reliance. I know it's easy to sing along with Frank Sinatra. I did it my way. How was that? We humans want to do this thing our way, everything our way. Forget the easy way. Forget the common way. Forget the best way, God's way. According to the Bible, that's exactly our problem. We all have wandered away like sheep. Each of us have gone our own way. Isaiah 53, 6. Have you ever wondered why the Bible refers to us as sheep? Of all God's creatures, Sheep are the least able to take care of themselves. Sheep are dumb. Ever seen a sheep trick? Sheep are defenseless. You don't see sheep as team mascots. You've heard of the Cardinals, the Rams, the Bulls, the Seahawks, but never the New York sheep. Okay, there's more. Dogs and cats clean themselves. The birds take a bath. Bears clean in the river. But sheep get dirty and stay dirty. Couldn't David have thought of a better metaphor for us than sheep? Maybe David remembered the days of his youth when he was a shepherd. He remembered how he lovingly attended to the sheep day and night. He slept with them. He cleaned them. I guess David rejoiced when he said, the Lord is my shepherd. And he was proud to say, I am his sheep. Are we still, un are we still uncomfortable with being called sheep? Do we all have it under control? We're not grumpy or sullen. We're not like Jekyll or Hyde. We're always upbeat, upright. Our relationships are sweet as fudge. We love all and are loved by all. We have no fears. We're Teflon tough. We control our moods. We don't need forgiveness. There are no mistakes. Maybe we do need a shepherd. Let me not, let's not resist him. Let's embrace him and say, I'll do it God's way. Did you know there's a condition out there that aff afflicts 70 million Americans and causes 38,000 deaths each year? 
It costs $70 billion worth in lack of productivity. Teenagers suffer from it. Middle-agers face it. Um, the worst cases occur between the ages of 30 and 40. It afflicts senior citizens by about 50%. Treatment involves everything from mouth guards to herbal tea to drugs and medication. You know what I'm describing? Chemical abuse, divorce, long sermons, None of these, none of the above is correct. The right answer is insomnia. Americans cannot get enough sleep. I can relate to this. Often I lay awake thinking about the 70 million other people out there who also can't sleep, and that makes me mad and keeps me awake. I should think about the 23rd Psalms, but instead, I check out a bag of weariness. Our bodies are tired. If 70 million people are not sleeping enough, then one-fifth of our country is dozing off at work, napping through class, sleeping at the wheel. Get a load of this. I didn't make this up. 30 tons of aspirin, sleeping pills, tranquilizers are consumed each day, each day. And a lot of so-called relief goes up in smoke. I know there's money to be made, degrees to be earned, ladders to climb. Our minds are tired. Our bodies are tired. But much more important, our souls are tired. We are, we are questioning the meaning of life. Where am I going? A lot of these questions steal our rest. You know, dogs sleep and they like to doze off. Bears hibernate. Cats invaded, invented cat naps. Most animals know how to rest, but there is one exception. These animals are woolly, simple-minded, and slow. Sheep can't sleep. For sheep to sleep, everything has to be just right. No problems, no tension in the flock, no bugs, no hunger. Everything needs to be just so. Sheep cannot find safe pastures. They cannot spray themselves with bug spray, deal with friction, can't even find their own food. They need help. They need a shepherd to lead them, help them to lie down in green pastures. Without a shepherd, they cannot rest. Without a shepherd, neither can we. Psalms 23, 2. The shepherd declares, the shepherd selects the travel and prepares the pasture. Our job is to watch the shepherd. With our eyes on the shepherd, we'll be able to get some sleep. Isaiah 26, 3 says, you will keep in perfect peace when your mind is fixed on Jesus because you trust Jesus and Jesus trusts you. Amen. Change your focus and relax. And while you're at it, follow God's plan to rest. Don't let the world get in the way. God made a big deal about rest in the Ten Commandments. Of all ten, which occupies the most space? Murder, adultery, stealing. These are very important topics, but God needed only five English words to condemn adultery and only four words to denounce thievery and murder. But when it came to the topic of rest, 
One sentence was not enough. Remembering the Sabbath rest took from Exodus 8 to 11. God knows us well. We have a lot of excuses to stay busy, and that's okay. However, God reminds us he's busy too. In fact, in six days, he created the heavens, the earth, the sea, and all that in them is. And what did he do? Rested on the seventh day. And he still does. Jesus, Jesus invites us to rest in him. Can you imagine the satisfaction in the heart of our shepherd when our work is done? We, his sheep, rest in the tender grasses of his love. So when David says, he makes me lie down in his finished work, with his own pierced hands, Jesus created a pasture for our soul. He removes condemnation. He pries loose the huge boulders of sin. In its place, he planted seeds of grace and lakes of mercy. This is not a pasture that you have made or deserve. It's a free gift from God, Ephesians 2, 8. In a world of human failure, there is a word and land of mercy. Our shepherd invites us there. He wants us to lie down in his mercy and grace. And there you will find rest. O oh, Father in heaven, we long to live with you in your home. We pray that you'll hasten the day. We love you. We worship you. We come to you with all our needs, and we lay our burdens at your feet. Thank you for taking care of us, Lord, and being our God. Now be with us as we go throughout the rest of this Sabbath day. Guide and protect us. Bring us back safely next week. We pray, Lord. Amen.